unfortunately, it's the kind of matrix we're going to be talking about today. So, as much as that the reigning code thing, so I was making to think of, uh, I mean, it's obviously right from the matrix, you know, Reeves as Neo, but that reference is a little old for you, maybe. Look it up. It's a good movie. But we need to talk about matrices and what a matrix is and how it does, uh, how it does things, how, how we can do things with matrices. Because when we talk about things like multiple regression and ANOVA and kind of correlation and all these other topics, they're all going to be built on this idea of sort of matrix um, equations, matrix algebra. So even though we're not going to get too far into it and we're not going to spend too much time, you know, diving into the, the, the depth of matrix algebra, we need to at least introduce some of the topics, some of the, some of the lingo in around matrices so that it's familiar. We can sort of understand and uh, you know, it's not that bad. Don't be scared. Okay. It's not going to be as fun as watching the matrix, but still not scary. So what's a matrix? A matrix is just an array of numbers. Okay? It's just a, it's a way of organizing numbers into a group like this. Now, whether you know it or not, you've worked with matrices, you've dealt with them. If you've ever worked with Excel or SPSS, which I'm assuming you have at this point, then you've worked with a data matrix. Okay? So it's just a way of sort of organizing numbers. So just a rectangular arrays of items. A typical matrix is a rectangular array of numbers arranged in rows and columns. So you have, in this case, three rows. There are four columns. And then we denote that oftentimes we use capital letters to indicate that uh, we're talking about a matrix. And this particular matrix, especially with these numbers down below, this is the rows and the columns. So rows first, columns second. This is a three by four matrix, three rows, four columns. By convention, the matrices are sized by the number of rows by the number of columns. And I just said a second ago. So rows M by columns N. Okay, it's a little bit confusing. Actually, I don't know. M by M is it, the number, the letters don't really matter because oftentimes we use N to refer in a data matrix to the rows and it could be a different set of letters. But anyway, the, just the idea that M and N or A and B or whatever it is you want to call these letters. These dimensions don't have to be the same. Like typically they're different numbers. You have, you know, five rows by 10 columns or whatever. They don't have to be the same number. So here, again, that same three by four. This is a square matrix that is, has the same dimensions, same number of rows as it does columns. Here is a four by two, four rows, two columns. And then you get this special case here of a one by one. This matrix has just one row and one column. Well, I mean, that's just a scalar, it's just an individual number. So in a way, a scalar like this, a one by one matrix, it's a special matrix that we call a scalar. It's just a single number. We're, we're used to dealing with these, you know, multiplying scalars and adding scalars up, single individual numbers. So a single number is just a special case of the matrix where rows and columns are both one. And there are special matrices that, you know, that, that come up with a lot, like a square matrix, which means that the rows and columns have the same number, the same dimensions. There's also, you, you may um, you have, have seen or read or heard the term vector. A vector is just a special matrix in which one of the dimensions is one. So in this case, this is a four by one vector because there are four rows and only one column. This is a one by three vector because there is one row but three columns. Right? So anytime one of the dimensions is one and the other one is not, right? then because they are both one, it'd be a scalar. So four by one is a one by three. They're both vectors. So either of them are one but not both. Like I said before, a, a scalar is just a one by one matrix. And uh, there's also something called a zero matrix, which is literally just a 
matrix of zeros, regardless of the size. If all the entries in there are zero, that's a zero matrix. And then another special matrix called the identity matrix, where it is a square matrix where, again, the, the dimensions are the same size. It's an M by M or N by N or whatever. It's the, they're the same size, but it has a special thing where you have zeros on all the off diagonals. So this is the diagonal I'm talking about. So you have ones down the diagonal, and you have zeros in the off diagonal. And I'm thinking, like, why would we need these matrices? Well, this works like a zero does if you're multiplying scalars and you want to in, in, introducing zeros, sort of zeros everything out. This one works like multiplying or dividing by one or something where if I take something and multiply it by one, well, I just get it back again. So this is the matrix version of multiplying by one, the identity matrix. It's called the identity matrix because you multiply any matrix by an identity matrix. It, gives it back that matrix. You're able to identify that matrix again. Again, with some strains, like why do we need to do that? But you'll see cases where it comes up. All right, so scalar, zero matrix, identity matrix. We also can talk about matrices in terms of their rank. So where you might see this if you're running some running analysis. Okay, so let's say you're you're in SPSS and you're running something or you're in a program like EQS or M plus or Levon if you're taking 534. You might get a, a message back where you're trying to run something, you're trying to do a MANOVA, you're trying to run something that relies on matrix algebra. You might get an error back that says something like, cannot invert matrix or the matrix is not full rank. Okay, so not full rank meaning that it doesn't have enough sort of unique information in it. So full rank down here, the matrix is considered full rank when all vectors are linearly independent. So you can think about in a matrix, let's go back one slide here for a second. Go back to, it's actually, look at this one. So with this B matrix, I can think of, it's a three by three matrix, but you can think of I have like one, two, three column vectors, or I have, one, two, three row vectors. So when it talks here about when all vectors are linearly independent, it means that the rows are not, not correlated with one another, the columns aren't correlated. Oftentimes we get in trouble with this when dealing with some matrices if we inadvertently, accidentally include a composite, like a sum of variables, along with the variables that are in the composite at the same time in like a regression or ANOVA, you make it this thing where it's not full rank because the variables are related to one another. They're not independent. So as it's trying to extract information, there's not enough information to extract that because not all the information is unique and actually has a lot of overlap. So rank of, of a matrix is, is the maximum number of linearly independent vectors, either row or column in a matrix, right? So you can actually rank them, but usually all we care about is a, is a matrix full rank or not. And we want it to be full rank or at least close to, you know, close to full rank in order to invert or do other fancy things we need to for things like canonical correlation, MANOVA, even multiple regression. Okay. What about some functions? What can we do with matrices? What are these sort of new jargon, this new jargon that we've never had to deal with before? Now you've probably, if you've used programs like Excel or even Google Sheets or something, you've probably dealt with transpose, maybe, maybe not, where you've copied a, you know, some columns or something and you want to make them rows. You sort of wanting to flip the matrix around and change the dimensions. So that's what a matrix transpose is. I mean, and there is, literally is a transpose function in Excel that, that you can use. You can highlight numbers, you can paste them in a different part of, of the spreadsheet and transpose it. Literally takes a matrix like this one and it's just transposing it so that it's flipping it around and putting it here. Okay. So you see the 21, that's the first, the first entry in the first column and the first row stays the first column and first row but now instead of of the column going down this way it's going this way 
And the row that goes this way is now the first column going that way. Okay, so it's literally taking. If you think about it, it's like taking this this matrix. And instead, of, it's not just doing this with it. Right? It's not just sort of flipping it this way. It's actually taking and flipping it like this. Right. So it's actually taking this and flipping it around like that. Like this seventy seven. Right. Is is coming around to there. Right, my pinky is pinky <laughs> to you. Okay, so you can see maybe I could it's a dark green. You can see like for instance the 77 here. Right? That's moving around to the outside of there, right? The 44, right? Is moving to this position. And the 21 is moving to in the same, the 21 sort of stays in the same place. I thought it was a 33. But you can see like the 79 and 13 have flip-flopped. Where 13 is here now, 79 is there, so it's flip-flopped around. And the same, just to be complete here, for the first row, look at that 62, for instance, here. 62 is now going there. The 33 down here, and the 93 is down there, right? so it's flip-flop around that way. So the first row has now become the first column. Second row is now the second column. Third row is now the third column. Okay. So just like scalars, numbers that we're used to working with, you can add matrices, you can subtract them, you can even multiply and divide them. So adding, subtracting are actually a bit easier but it's a little bit restricted. So I can add two matrices or subtract them. I can, I can do simple arithmetic functions like that, add and subtract, as long as the matrices are the same size. They have to be exactly the same size, which means they have that same number of columns and number of rows. So you can simply add and subtract the corresponding components. So if I have two matrices, A and B, I, I realize just, to, just in case you're like really, really super paying attention, this B is not this B. It's a different B. This B is a three by three, right? So I'm just have renamed this matrix B two by three. So I have two two by three matrices. I'm not trying to force or cram the three by three somehow. It's a different B matrix. They're the same size, which means that I can add them together, right? So all I'm going to do. It's really easy. It seems like it'd be complicated, or because it's matrices. Everyone. You hear the term matrix or, or matrix algebra, and you're like, oh my god, you know, you need to change your underpants because uh, it seems so terrifying, okay? But no, it's actually pretty easy. I just want to add two matrices together. I'm just going to take all the parts. The first, uh, this number that's in the first row, first column, I'm going to add that to the numbers in the first row, the first column of this one. So to add them two together, you're going to get, so here's this one and five is, is really this one and this five. This two and six, I'm just adding that two and that six. All the pieces are in the corresponding places. This three and this seven. Right? Seven, three. This one is this eight and this four. And this one is this nine and this five. So I'm just adding up those components, putting them in a new matrix. So then our new A plus B matrix. Still a two by three, nothing about the dimensions change. You're just adding up the component parts. I can do the same thing by via subtraction. I take one minus five. One minus five is negative four. Two minus six, negative four. Three minus seven, negative four. Okay, so we're, we're just subtracting the corresponding values in each position in the matrix. Okay, that's it. Very straightforward. Addition, subtraction, very easy. Make the multiplying, dividing, increasingly more complicated. Let's talk about matrix multiplication. So matrix multiplication has a, a different set of rules. You're not talking about trying to, you're not just multiplying. There is actually a, a sort of unit by unit multiplication that, that is a, a matrix function, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about multiplying the entire matrix. So to do that, there's a couple different cases of that. So if I'm just 
taking a matrix like this and I'm multiplying it by a scalar, just a single value, a one by one. That's easy. I just multiply each part, each number by five, and that's it. That's actually pretty straightforward. Okay. So here, if I'm taking x times a, I can take this five times one, five times two, we're just multiplying each of the parts to get our new matrix. This is now sort of xa. All right, new matrix. That part's easy. Now, if I want to multiply two matrices, however, not quite as easy. There's some, some rules. And this equation that at first glance may seem super complicated, but let's walk through it slowly. Multiplying a matrix by a matrix. The product of matrices A and B is defined if the number of columns in A equals the number of rows in B. What? All right, so let's think about this for a second. What does that first thing mean? The product of matrices A and B is defined the number of columns in A equals the number of columns in rows in B. Like, what? It's saying if I have two matrices, okay, if I have a matrix A that has, again, like, M by N dimensions, okay, whatever these two numbers are. And I have another matrix B that say has, I don't know, J and K dimensions, whatever those numbers are. Because N does not equal J, I can't multiply these two. So they go again. It is identified if, or is defined if the number of columns in A, number of columns, that's this number, is equal to the number of rows in B. So these, the inner dimensions of the two matrices have to match. Okay, so if, if this instead was an M by N matrix, and this was a N by K matrix, then awesome, then this doesn't apply anymore. These two inner dimensions match, so I can actually multiply them. If you have two matrices where the inner dimensions do not match, you can multiply. That's it. Right? Assuming A has I by J dimensions and B has J by K, the resulting matrix C will have dimensions I by K. What? So if I'm doing this, M by N, N by K. If A has M by N and B has M by K, A, B, A, B will have the outer dimension. Sounds like a, I think it's was a sci-fi show, The Outer Dimensions, no, The Outer Limits. Anyway, it sounds like it'd be a cool sci-fi show, The Outer Dimensions. So AB would have an M by K dimensions, right? Inner dimensions have to match. The resulting matrix will have the outer dimensions. N by N has to match in the inside dimensions. M by K will be then a result. In other words, in order to multiply then the inner dimensions must match, and the result is the outer dimensions. So let's think about that. So let's say I have these two, these two things. Because n and n match, okay, I can multiply a times b. With regular math, right, when we're multiplying things, we have two numbers, 5 and 6. 5 times 6 equals the same thing as 6 times 5. The order doesn't matter. With matrices, in this case, A times B, right, is defined because of the dimensions. B times A, however, is not. I got the wrong. B times A, however, is not defined. So that you can't reverse the order of matrices and multiply them just because you can multiply in one direction doesn't mean you can multiply any other one. Uh, I forgot the name of the property in math. I don't remember. If I, if I remember it, I'll stick it up. So I can stick it here somewhere. The property where you're allowed to multiply in either direction. Transitive, something like that. It doesn't sound right. Whatever. Matrices do not work the same way. Okay. Because the inner dimensions match, A times B is defined. But if I wanted to re reverse the multiplication, it wouldn't be because then it'd be 
K and M dimensions on, or are the inner dimensions, and you can't multiply. Each element in C can be computed by, okay, so C, you gotta follow this along a little bit. So C has I by K dimensions. So each I by K combination, we're gonna get by summing up the, the parts in the matrix that actually have similar uh, units of row. So the matching row, the matching column here, matching row there, we're gonna actually multiply them and for all the, the, the subsequent parts. We're gonna, so we're, gonna, we're gonna multiply them and then we're gonna sum up across all the, the dimensions that match to get each of the I by C components. Okay, so th this by itself is, it seems like, well, oh, it seems confusing. It seems a little bit almost misleading, but we're gonna, we're gonna multiply m m a, series of no a series of values between the two matrices, to then sum them up to be a then single unit in the new matrix. Because remember, this is an M by N and this is an N by K. So we're rearranging things into this new M by K matrix. So things need to be sort of squished and, and remade to be into a, uh, to a new set of dimensions for the new matrix. So we're gonna do that by multiplying and summing across components to get our new component here. So again, without putting it into context, it seems just like, what? but we're gonna use this idea what we're doing here and we'll apply it to the next slide. All right, so let's, let's try to take this equation that seems to make no sense and let's apply it to an example here. All right, so I have two matrices, A and B. So this, this time, because A and B before, when I added them, I, they were the same dimension, so I was able to add them. So this time what I did is I took, I'm gonna, I'm gonna multiply A times B transpose. So I transpose B, so now it's a three by two, two by three, and a three by two, I can multiply, right? Because the inner dimensions match, and the new matrix we'll call C, or you can call it AB, or whatever you wanna call it. So the new matrix C is gonna be two by two. All right, so a two by three times a three by two will give you a two by two matrix. So some way I'm, I'm collapsing this information down into these four numbers. So let's look at this equation that we, we started talking about here. So if, if I'm doing this right, start here. I want to figure out what my C11 is. Here's my C11. Those are the two, the I and the K that I'm interested in, okay? That means I'm going to sum across, I'm going to sum across J, whatever that is. Okay, we don't know that, I haven't quite defined that yet. But it is, and I'm going to treat this, my A value is going to be then 1 by J. And my B value is going to be, because they're both 1, 1 j by one okay so because again i, I want to multiply these out so in the end i'm getting one and one on the outside dimensions which is what i want here c11 so i need to take my a my a1 and all j and which means i, I want to take a my a1 times all because a the second thing is the columns i want the first row all columns times the first all columns of the first row, sorry, first row, all columns by all rows times the, you know, of the first column. What? First row, all columns, all rows of the first column. Let's think about that for a second. I want to take my A1J. So what's A1J? A1, the first row, and it and I want the jth column. That means I'm going to take a1j. That's a1j is right here. So I'm going to take my a1j, this thing, and I'm going to multiply that by my bj1, same number here, bj1. Okay, the first column. I want to do all rows. So I'm going to multiply those together. So this is going to be one times five. So my first part of that. All right, now I'm gonna still stay with my first row of A, 
But I'm gonna go to the next column, two. Okay, so let's do it. Let's do. Let's color code this even. Okay, so my next column is two. I'm gonna go two, and then I'm gonna go to the next row of B, staying in the first column. The next row of B would be going down, but in the same column. So I'm gonna multiply this by six, like that. So this is now gonna be. I'm gonna add this to two times six. All right. So then I now have. I'm staying with the first row. Go in the next column. Same first row, next column. So again, let's do a different color. I'm blue this time. All right. So I'm doing this one. For B, I'm going to go to the next row, but stay in the first column. So that's this one. And I'm going to add that to it. So that's three times seven. So this ends up being five. Plus twelve plus twenty one. Okay. So twenty one and twelve, that's thirty three, thirty eight, I believe. So this value here is now going to be thirty eight. Right? This is the, and you can sort of. I know I'm explaining this in a sort of clunky way, but you think about it, the way you're going to multiply, you're going to go like this. For the first one, it's just because you're going down here, you're going to cross A and down B. Because those, right? those are the dimensions that match. This has three columns. This one has three rows. So I'm going to be multiplying columns by rows. All right? Boom, boom, boom. I'm going to go to the next one. I'm going to go, if I, I'm going to go like ding, ding, ding. Next one could be back up here, doom, doom, doom. And next one's gonna be doom, doom, doom. All right, so all these different pieces are gonna are gonna be that way. Let's see if I did, I had this pre-made here. So there we go, look. All right, so we got one times five, two times six, three times seven, 38. So if I do this sort of quickly, again, thinking about, if I go to the next one, so if I wanna stay with, so like here, like C12, which means I'm staying in, in for A, I'm staying in, because the, the first one's referring to A, the second one's referring to B. I want to stay in the first row of A, but the second column of B. So again, because with B, I'm, all the second numbers are referring to the B columns, the first numbers are referring to the A rows. This was A, the first row of A times the first column of B. This is the first column, the first row of A times the second column of B. So C12, but if, uh, if I do, I want to do C1, C1, 2. That is simply taking 1 times 3, 3 times 4, 3 times 5. All right, so 1 times 5, I'm sorry, 1 times, 1 times 3, plus 1 times 3, plus 2 times 4, plus, and then here, 3 times 5. That's three plus eight, 11 plus 15 would be 26, I believe. And I can keep doing that. Seven times, then I'm gonna go for C21. I'm gonna go to the second row of A, right? That's the first number, times the first column B. So that's seven times five, eight times six, nine times seven. And then for C22, second row of A, second column of B, seven times three, eight times four, Years in the way, nine times five. Okay, so let's check through that. Here's all of it all together. And it looks like it's uh, so far so good. One times three, two times four, two times five, twenty six. So I did what I did here. Next one, seven times five, seven times five, eight times six, nine times seven. Gives me the 155 and then 7 times 3, 8 times 4, 9 times 5, 
give me the 98. And they go in those positions. So I need a matrix. If I multiply A times B prime, C with the 2 by 2 is now these numbers, 38, 26, 155, and 98. Okay. So again, the thing to keep in mind, first number here, the first number refers to the, the rows of A you're dealing with. The second number tells you the column of B you're dealing with. You're going to multiply based on the inner dimensions because they're the same number. And you're going to sum across all those numbers, all the J numbers. In this case, there are three J numbers because J is the inner dimension. Three and three. So I'm going to sum three numbers. Five, twelve, twenty-one. And that's going to give me the P one one numbers. Right. Believe it or not, you can actually. This is something that can also be done in Excel. There's ways to do matrix multiplication. Again, as long as the matrices are have the same inner dimensions, you can multiply them uh, via Excel um, using a matrix multiplication uh, function. Now, you may have been expecting that the next slide would be dividing matrices. And we're going to get there. But first, we've got to talk about something else, which is something called the matrix determinant. So we need that to be able to divide. So we're going to talk about so uh, an, uh, another set of topics, which is how to reduce matrices, which the determinant is part of that. And then we'll talk about how to use the determinant to do matrix division. Okay. So there's lots of ways in which people try to reduce matrices. So matrices are a large number of data points. That's why they're scary. That's why people tend to you know, get nervous when you talk about matrix algebra, if you're dealing with all these numbers. So of course, our, our motivation is to, okay, well, how do I summarize this? How, how can I try to make this a little bit easier to, to use, to understand, to work with? So one way is something called the trace. For some very specific matrices, the trace is a very useful value. For instance, if you're dealing with correlation matrix, the trace will give you the number of variables. If you're dealing with variance covariance matrix, the trace will give you the sum of all the variances. There's so certain things that, that, are, that are useful just getting the trace. And the trace is simply, you're going to sum the diagonal of a square matrix. And it's always from the top left to the bottom right like this. So the trace ends up being the trace line or the the diagonal values are the ones here. All these others are considered off diagonal. So the diagonal, off diagonal. Okay. Right. So three, two, and one are off diagonal. Eight, six, and five are off diagonal. These are the diagonal. So if I just sum up those numbers on the diagonal, I get the trace of B is 20. And this is usually how it's written. T, R, B, B, trace of B. Add up the diagonal numbers, you get 20. Okay. That's the trace. Trace is easy. The determinant, it's not so easy. Let's talk about the determinant. The determinant of a matrix is just like the trace, we want a single value to represent the matrix. So we want to be able to, to, to summarize, break it, to bring it down, break it down. The trace is easy, it's just some it's just summing up the diagonal. The determinant's a bit different. The determinant of a square of a matrix, sorry, is a scalar representation of a matrix considered the volume. It's, you think of it sort of like how much information is in the matrix. It's a way of getting at the amount of in, unique information and stuff in the matrix that, that, can, that is useful or can be used. Okay, In the case of a variance-covariance matrix, you can think of the determinant as the generalized variance, right? sort of the average or general variance in the matrix. If the matrix is a sum of squares and cross product matrix, the trace is the sum of squares right, which is good. I'm not really sure what the determinant would be there. I guess the, the generalized sum of squares and cross products as well. If it's a correlation matrix, the trace is just the number of, the number of variables, but the determinant of a correlation matrix can can tell you whether or not the matrix, it, it, whether or not there it's, it's full rank, and some other things that, that is useful about correlation matrices when we go to use them for things like factor analysis or something where we need to, to invert it to use for different purposes. Okay, so the, so the determinant has some uses predominantly 
It's to help you invert a matrix because inverting a matrix is how we're going to do matrix division. So you don't actually just divide the matrices, you actually create a inverted matrix and then you multiply your matrix A times your inverted matrix B in order to divide them. I'll explain that more in a second, but that's usually the goal. Usually if you see a matrix like A, in between two two lines like this, so usually, you know, usually when we see this, we think of like absolute value. Well, instead of being absolute value, this is now, if it's around a matrix, it's the matrix determinant. Now, only square matrices have determinants. So it's actually the same for the trace. You can only have a, a trace of a square matrix. So determinants are only useful for square matrices. If your matrix is not square, then there's no determinant, which also means you can't invert you can't divide, okay? Determinants are also useful because they tell us whether or not a matrix can be inverted, which is what we're getting to. So if you actually try to take, to find the determinant of a matrix and it comes back that the, the determinant is zero, that means the matrix cannot be inverted. Not all square matrices can be inverted, right? They must be full rank, so that means you have to have a non-singular, non-overlapping, non-correlated or a matrix that has that does not have correlated or overlapping vectors. Okay. Sounds scary. That's probably the more most complicated thing we're going to deal with in, in, in talking about matrices is this idea of inversion. And the determinant is what makes it sort of complicated. Let's think about what this actually means. So if you know if if you have a single scalar the determinant of that scalar is simply just the number, right? So the scalar is four, when the determinant of, four, of, of that is four, right? Not, not super useful. If you have a two by two matrix like this, A, A1, A2, B1, B2, okay? So we're naming them, this is the A column, B column, right? Thinking these as sort of column vectors, you know, column A vector, column B vector. You're going to simply multiply across so the two trace numbers, A1 times B2. And then I'm going to subtract the off diagonal numbers multiplied. So A1 times B2 minus B1 times A2. Now, if this is a, a variance covariance matrix, you know, two variables and their variances, and these would be their covariances. This is essentially the product of their variances minus the the covariance squared or something, right? Because it's just the covariance again twice being multiplied. Anyway, so the determinant here is become this times this. So if I do that for this matrix, and these are the numbers, I'm going to take three times one, okay? minus two times five. So then I get three minus 10 is negative seven. Now having a negative number, a negative determinant is fine. It just can't be zero. Okay. For a three by three matrix, it is broken down into a series of scalars and two by two matrices. So as the matrices get bigger, the idea of breaking it down in terms of determinant becomes more complicated. So let's talk about just briefly what a three by three does and, and how that works out. But we're not going to go further. We're not going to then how you do a four by four or five by five. If you want to get the determinant of a larger matrix, just use Excel or something to find it. But I do want you to understand sort of how it, the complexity of it works and where it sort of goes from there. So these are the sort of steps. You're going to start with the first entry, 1, 1. I mean, the first number in the first row, first column. So the very top left number. So it'd be the number that would sort of start the trace, right? The very top left number. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to think of that as a scalar. You're going to pull it out and use it as a scalar, a single value. And then you're going, to, you're going to pretend for a second that all the values in the same row and the same column don't exist. Okay? You're, going to, you're going to ignore them for a second. Then you're going to follow all the steps that we did back here in the last slide, where we're taking the A times B minus B for all the numbers in the remaining rows and columns, okay? So you're gonna multiply the scalar by the two by two determinant you have, but then you're gonna move on. You're then gonna go to the next scalar, do the next one, 
Then you're going to move on. Do the next scalar times the next one. You're going to repeat for each value in the first row, alternating, subtracting, and adding as you go. So you're going to do the first one minus the second one plus the third one. Okay. Again, it sounds like, you know, whatever. Let's, let's talk about how does that actually work. So here's my three by three matrix. So we have three column vectors, A vector, B vector, and C vector. A little bit confusing because we're calling this matrix. Matrix is also C, but whatever. This is just, you know, placeholder for stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with A. All right, so let's look at what this is doing here. I'm going to start with A. A is my, f so I'm, I'm going to deal with the first, the first row. Let me put a different marker. Do blue maybe will stand out a little bit. So this is so the, the first step, this last slide says, starting with the first entry and pull out as a scalar. Okay, so I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna pull this out as a scalar. So this is my single number. So I'm just replicating what's up there. And then I'm gonna forget what's going on here. And I forget what's going on here for now. I'm gonna just ignore those. Now look, I have a two by two here. So I'm just gonna do my two by two determinant I'm going to multiply this. It's, it's showing here. I want to then do my B2 times C3 minus C2 times B3 thing there to get the determinant for that one. Okay, so I'm going to get the determinant for this little matrix here. And then I'm going to keep going. I'm going to subtract. Okay, so... That, that's for the first one. I, I took this first scalar out, and then I found the determinant of this remaining little matrix that didn't have the first row or first column in it. Okay, like that. And that's what this little thing is here. Then I'm going to go and subtract out the next one. So the next one, I'll change the color. Now I'm going to pull out, I'm going to pull out B1. I'm going to ignore everything that's in the same row and column. What I'm left with is I, I now need this A2, A3, C2, C3 is what's left. That's what's not in the row and column of B1 are, are these numbers. That's what goes here. And I'm going to find the determinant of that. A2 times C3 minus C2 times A3. And then... Keep going, keep on trucking. For, I'm gonna pull out C1. Again, I'm gonna ignore what's in the same row and column. And what's left is I'm gonna have A2, A3, B2, B3, A2, A3, B2, B3. I'm gonna find the determinant of that. And I'm again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna add, I'm gonna, I'm gonna subtract. And then the next one I'm gonna add if, if there was a bigger matrix, we would continue doing this instead of adding and subtracting. But you can see it down here. <clears throat> so if I if I apply it, here's my A11. Or my, I'm sorry, my C11, which is A12 times, and then I got 5 times 5 minus 1 times 4 here. The next one is, I want to move over to here, negative 2. That's this one. The negative 2 is in this column in this row, so I'm going to take negative 1 times 5 minus 1 times 3 as a determinant. That's this whole thing here. And as I move over again, I have 0. And again, I'm going to ignore everything that's in this column and this row. So it's 0 times, and then I'm going to take negative 1 times 4 minus 5 times 3. Obviously, this whole thing is going to be dropping out to zero anyway, but, you know, just to show you what's going on, to start collapsing things. 5 times 5 is 25. 1 times 4 is 4. All right. One time, negative 1 times 5 is negative 5. 1 times 3 is 3. 1 times 5, negative 1 times 5 is negative 5. 5 times 3 is 15. So I'm just starting to just collapse them down. So I get 25 minus 4 is 21. Negative 5 minus 3 is negative 8. Negative 5 minus 15 is 20. So 2 times 21 is 42. Negative 2 times negative 8 is 16. And then 0 times negative 20 is 0. So add it up, we get that the determinant of the matrix is 26.
Now, do I recommend doing this? Is this something that you should do for fun on rainy weekend? Probably not. However, you will be responsible on an exam for as much as a three by three determinant, just to sort of make sure you're following along and understand what's going on. So this process, you will be asked to do probably one question on the exam. Here's a three by three matrix. What is the determinant? Okay. And you need to show me the steps. You can't just give me the number because you can always put the number into Excel and ask for the, or the matrix into Excel and ask for the determinant. I want you to show me how you found it in all these steps. Just keep that in mind. Okay, I'm warning you now. Fair warning. It will be on the exam a three by three. Again, it's just to check that you're understanding what the process is and everything else. All right. Probably didn't sound fun, but good idea to understand is you're trying to break all the pieces down in this matrix and try to break it down to a single number. Now you can imagine going to four by four, it's going to be exponentially more complicated. Five by five. Oftentimes we're dealing with, you know, giant matrices. You're trying to do a factor analysis, have 24 items on a scale. So it's going to be a 24 by 24 matrix trying to find the determinant stuff is going to be insane. It's going to be a lot, a lot of craziness like this. It just gets more and more complicated the bigger it gets. So why do we care, right? The determinant, I mean, that's, you know, it's, just, it's the volume of a matrix or whatever. Well, it has a good use. So, and I, like I'm saying here, for any matrix beyond three by three, just, you know, leave it to the computers to figure out. If a determinant of a matrix is zero, it means the matrix cannot be inverted since the inversion process requires that you divide by the determinant. So what's the common cause of determinants equaling zero? Well, you have vectors in it that are overlapping. Right. So you have variables in a data matrix, something that are highly correlated. You actually put in a composite along with its items or something it will cause determinants equal zero. So if, if a matrix is not full rank, you can come back with, with, with a determinant equaling zero, and then you can't do the matrix algebra stuff, like in regression and stuff that we'll talk about soon. All right. So the main reason why we find determinants is for finding the inverse of a matrix. So a matrix inverse is needed to perform the quote division. Because normally you're not dividing, you're multiplying by an inverse, which is sort of the same thing, but just to make sure we're not actually dividing in the way we're used to thinking about it. So in scalar terms, single number terms, if I want to take and divide B into A, so A divided by B is the same thing as taking A times one over B. Put that into context just to make sure we're on the same page. If I want to take, you know, five divided by six, that is the same thing as five times one sixth. Okay. So if I simply take and invert one over the number is an, is, is an inversion, I can then multiply and it's the same thing. 5 divided by 6 is the same thing as taking 5 times 1 6. Okay? So, with that being said, we're going to do this process with matrices. We're going to take and instead of straight dividing, we're going to find the inverse of a matrix and then multiply those matrices. When we want to divide a matrix A by matrix B, we simply multiply A by the inverse of B. So we need to find the inverse of B. So, and it's said to be defined if, if this, if, if, if I take an inverted matrix like A to the negative one, this actually means an inversion, right? So I'm taking a square matrix N by N, I'm going to, going to invert it. It is an inversion of the matrix as long as if I take the original A matrix, multiply it by the inversion, it should give me the identity matrix, right? So the matrix multiplied by its inversion should give me the identity matrix. And the same thing is also true that the inversion times the matrix should give you identity. It shouldn't matter which way you multiply it. it sh you should get the identity matrix either way. So here that transitive or whatever property is actually working, right? I can multiply this way, I get, I get the identity matrix. Multiply that, I get the identity matrix. This is the same thing, going back to our example again. If, if, I, want, if I have six... And I want to invert it. That's one sixth. If I multiply 
six times one six, one six, six times one six gives me one. Okay, so the number times its inversion should give you one. Same thing that one six times six is also one. That actually works the same way. It should work the same way with matrices. Okay, that multiplying the matrix by its inverse should give you the identity matrix. Multiplying the inverted matrix by itself, by its original matrix, should also give you the identity matrix. That's how we know that, uh, that we found the appropriate inverted matrix. This also partially works well because because of square matrices, all the dimensions are the same. So that's why the order doesn't matter. You're going to get the same dimensions at the end. It all works out. So the way we find the inverse, and again, let's do this for a two by two, simple enough. For a two by two matrix, the inverse is relatively simple. So what do we do? So I have this a this two by two, a one, a two, b one, b two. I want to invert it. I want to take one over the determinant of the matrix. Okay. And then you can see in the in the off diagonal numbers, I want to switch their sign. So this becomes negative B1, negative A2. Right? So I'm put negatives on both of those. And then these two numbers switch places. All right? So I'm going to take A1 and B2, and I want to swap them out. So what that what so the the original matrix is 3, 5, 2, 1. The 5 and the 2 get negatives. 5 and 2 get negatives. The 3 and the 1 switch places. So that what I have, and then I'm going I'm to multiply this scalar, this, this determinant scalar that we've made, I'm gonna, this thing right here, through all the numbers. So this 1 becomes, because we've got a negative 7, this 1 becomes negative 1, 7. This negative two becomes two sevenths. This negative five becomes five sevenths. And the negative three, sorry, the three becomes a negative three sevenths because again, the negative seven there. We multiply all that out, or I should say divide all those out and we get these numbers, okay? If I take my three, my original three, two, five, one matrix, this one, multiply it by this inversion, I get the identity matrix. So you want to try it out? You can look at the, the first value on my list. Three, three divided by not divided by three times point one four three equals negative. Actually, something's not right. Oh, and then two times, sorry, two times, two times 0.714 equals, yeah, so two times 0.714 is 0.14, is, is 1.428. Let me write that. So I was trying to multiply that. So if we're trying to multiply these out, I'm going to take three times negative. 0.143, right? To get my first, to get my first part of this, this part here, I'm going to add to that two times 0.714 times 0.714. So just that first one. This is just like C11, right? The the first, this this of the identity matrix, or I should say, called I. My I11, I11, the first upper, right? So three times negative 0.143, three times three equals, so this first part is negative 0.429 plus the second part, two times 0.714. Essentially, one. Okay, I mean, it's not exactly this close. One. I didn't really carry out enough decimal places for this to work perfectly, but you know, point negative point four two nine plus one point four two eight. We're going to essentially one. Same thing will work out here when we're working out the numbers. 
for the bottom to also be one, but the offset angle is going to be zero. I'm not going to go through and show that. If you want to try it, you know, try it out, you can. Let those two out. It should come out really close to one, one, and zero, zero. It might be a little bit off just because of the rounding, but it should be really close. Okay. All right, so what happens if you try to invert a matrix that's singular, right, not full rank and stuff? A matrix is considered singular. The determinant of the matrix is zero. All right, the matrix can't be inverted, usually caused by linear dependencies between vectors when, when a matrix is not full rank. This is what happens. So if you look, 2 and 1, if I multiply this by 3, I get that. If I divide this by 3, I get that. But if I, if I take and divide this by 2, I get this. Multiply this by, by 2, I get that. So they, they're the same thing. It's just it's super redundant. Even though they're different numbers, they're super redundant with one another because they're exactly corresponding. So if I try to find the, in, the determinant of this, right, 2 times 3 minus 6 times 1, right, this right here, I get zero. So my determinant is zero, which tells me that it's not full rank. And if I try to then plug this into some process like here, I'm taking one over the determinant, this is zero. So I'm now going to be multiplying one over zero into everything in here, making everything zero. It can't be inverted. I cannot find an inverted matrix if the determinant is zero. All right, that's it for matrices, at least for now. Uh, you probably have lots of questions, and I'm sure talk about them during lab but no fear all right if you need to you go back watch some parts of it again it can be a little tricky to follow along sometimes and there's lots and lots of resources on this stuff online if you just look up sort of matrix algebra and uh, how to transpose how to invert that kind of stuff you can probably find some other resources if you need more information